بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على سيد الرسل وخاتم الانبياء وعلى اله الاسكياء واصحابه الاتقياء اما بعد عن ام المؤمنين ام عبد الله عائشه رضي الله عنها قالت قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من احدث في امرنا هذا ما ليس منه فهو رد رواه البخاري ومسلم وفي رواية للمسلم من عمل عملا ليس عليه أمرنا فرد The hadith is narrated by Aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said whoever innovates something in this matter of ours that is not of it will have it rejected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another narration that Imam Muslim rahmatullahi alayhi reports, he who does an act which we have not commanded will have it rejected. This hadith is the fifth hadith from the 40 hadith collection of Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi. And as we heard from the hadith that it is narrated by Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. <coughs> Aisha radiallahu anha is one of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Her birth name is Aisha, the daughter of Abu Bakr, al-Taymi al-Qurashi, or al al-Qurashiya. She is the third wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She is the only wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was previously not widowed or divorced. She was not a divorcee or a widow. Her kunya, the name she commonly was known by along with Aisha, is Umm Abdullah. Now, the kunya generally is an attribution that you make towards one's child while calling on an individual. So we talked about the kunya earlier on in the previous ahadith because many sahaba had a kunya. Now the interesting thing about Aisha radiallahu anha and calling her Umm Abdullah is that Anyone that has studied her life even briefly or even knows a little bit about her, one thing you'll know is that her entire life she was only married to one person and that was the Prophet ﷺ. And during her 10 years with the Prophet ﷺ, she had no children with the Prophet ﷺ. If she had no children with the Prophet ﷺ, then the question is, how is she getting this name, Umm Abdullah, the mother of Abdullah? Now one scholar by the name of Ibn al-Arabi, he says that the reason why she was called Umm Abdullah is because she had a child and which resulted in a miscarriage. So she never delivered the child, she was bearing a child which resulted in a miscarriage. Therefore she was called Umm Abdullah, naming the child that she miscarried. But majority of the scholars and a large group of scholars, they refute this heavily and they say that we find no reference of a miscarriage from any of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and particularly not with Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. So there must be some misunderstanding here. Majority of the scholars they say that she was given this name Umm Abdullah by the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She once said, one day said, "O Messenger of Allah, I would like to have a kunya." Everyone has a kunya. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam called her Umm Abdullah, and the reason why he called her the mother of Abdullah is because Aisha radiallahu anha's sister Asma had a son and her first son's name was Abdullah. So she was the aunt of Abdullah bin Zubayr. And she treated Abdullah bin Zubayr like her own child. And in some narrations we also find that she brought her into her home and she looked after her like her own child. So therefore she was called Umm Abdullah. She was also known as Humaira was also known as Siddiqa. The Prophet ﷺ at times would call her Aish, a shorter form of Aisha. In this hadith, Imam Nawawi as he brings it, the first attribute he uses, the first uh, attribute he uses to call on the Prophet ﷺ is an important one. He calls her Ummul Mu'mineen, the mother of the believers. What we learn from this is that the wives of the Prophet ﷺ were the mothers of the believers. That his wives were your mothers. That's why whenever we refer to them, we call them our mothers, the mother of the believers, with respect and with honesty from our heart that we respect them the way they should and the way they deserve to be respected. 
Because unfortunately there are a group of people who are known for disrespecting the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. And that sort of an attitude of being disrespectful to any of the companions, let alone the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, we the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah view that to be absolutely unacceptable. And we cannot tolerate that sort of disrespect for someone who we proudly call Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. She accepted Islam from the early group of people who accepted Islam. Her nephew Urwa bin Zubayr, who was the younger brother of Abdullah bin Zubayr, he says that Aisha radiallahu anha was married to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. She one day told me that I don't know of any day that I ever saw my parents following a religion other than this religion, than, than this Islam. Because she was born in Islam. She was born in this religion. Therefore she says that when I gained my consciousness and I saw my mother Umm Ruman and my father Abu Bakr, I had never seen them on any religion other than Islam. And she says that a day would not pass by. But in the beginning and end of the day, the Prophet wasallam would come to visit us at our home. Aisha radiallahu anha was one day asked how she was honored and how she ended up marrying the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Aisha radiallahu anha explained by saying that one day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam saw a dream. And in this dream an angel came and he presented to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam this beautiful frame that was covered in a silk garment. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was then told that this is someone who will be one of your wives. And that garment was removed from that frame and inside it, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said to Aisha radiallahu anha that فَإِذَا أَنْتِ هِيَ When I opened up the garment from the frame, I saw that it was you inside it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitated the marriage of Aisha radiallahu anha with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Aisha radiallahu anha as a wife was someone who was very close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Someone who was very dear to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And because she had other co-wives, other wives who were also married to the Prophet ﷺ, even though she was pious, righteous, and a great scholar in her own, her own perspective, that didn't take away from her, her natural jealousy towards the others who were also married to the Prophet ﷺ. There are many narrations in this regard. One narration Aisha radiallahu anha herself says, that I have never seen anyone who can cook food as good as Safiya radiallahu anha. You know? She used to cook food so well, she used to cook food so one, so well. You know, very good cook, master chef. Ba'atat ila Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi ina'in fihi ta'amun. She one day sent some food to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a bowl. And when I, when the servant came and delivered the bowl to the Prophet, Aisha radiallahu anha was the one who opened the door. And she saw that Safiya was sending food on Aisha's day. So what does Aisha radiallahu anha do? She takes the bowl and does not deposit it in the fridge. She takes the bowl and she says, فَضَرَبْتُهُ biadi." I took it and I hit it really hard. فَكَسَرْتُهُ Until I broke the bowl. And then after she broke it, she realized that what she did was something she shouldn't have done. She just had her moment. So she said, فَقُلْتُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مَا كَفَّارَةُ هَذَا I said, O Messenger of Allah, what is the expiation for what I just did? I just broke her bowl and destroyed her food. What can I do? So the Prophet wasallam said, Ina'un makanu ina'in wa ta'amun makanu ta'amin. That you will send a bowl in place, of the spo- in, in place of the bowl you destroyed and you will send food in place of the food you destroyed. Right? And this um, you can call healthy jealousy that the wives, a natural jealousy the wives of the Prophet wasallam had amongst one another only remained as long as the Prophet was alive because they were only envious to spend more time and enjoy more time with Prophet Wasallam. Once the Prophet Wasallam passed away, the wives of the Prophet Wasallam became like sisters. And they were one strong family. After the Prophet passed away, you never find any narration of this sort or any narration of one Sahabiya, one wife of the Prophet saying anything to another wife of the Prophet Wasallam. Their, um, their, their, their quarrels were just due to them making their natural attempt to attract the love of the Prophet Now how many battles did Aisha radiallahu anha participate in? The only battle that you can authentically prove the Prophet the Aisha radiallahu anha participated in is the battle of Uhud. Um, Aisha radiallahu anha along with other women came to the battle of Uhud 
to give water to those Sahaba who were, who were injured during this battle. There are many places in the Quran where Aisha radiallahu anha is praised, indirectly and also directly. In particular, there are some verses in Surah An Nur that were revealed regarding Aisha radiallahu anha after she was accused by the hypocrites who resided in Medina Munawwara. The Prophet ﷺ was on a journey, and Aisha radiallahu anha was also with him. And they would carry the women in these carriages. And Aisha radiallahu anha, in terms of her physique, was a very thin person. She wasn't really that stocky. So when it was time for them to move from one place to another, Aisha radiallahu anha had gone somewhere. She wasn't in the carriage. The people came and they picked up the carriage. They didn't realize that she wasn't in there. And they, they left. The Prophet ﷺ also left. And all the Sahaba also left. Aisha radiallahu anha was, one of the, was the only one left behind. She came back, she was concerned and worried, everyone left her behind. So she thought to herself, the best thing I can do is go to sleep right here. I'll just sit here, wait here, because one, at some point or the other, the Prophet will realize I'm missing. And the last stop we had was here, so he'll send someone to come and look for me here. Or he'll come and collect me here. So Aisha radiallahu anha, she lied down and she fell asleep. And she says, when she opened her eyes, standing in front of her was a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. And his responsibility, when the Sahaba would move from one location and move on in their journey, it was a common habit of the Prophet that he would tell one Sahabi to go and scout the area to make sure nothing was left behind. In case anyone left a charger behind or anything, there's go and check it and bring it. So the Sahabi said, I came to check the area and I saw this lady there. And I recognized it was Aisha radiallahu anha because I had seen her before the verses of hijab were revealed. Because I had seen her before the verses of hijab were revealed, when I say hijab, I mean the covering of the face, niqab, for the wives of the Prophet, I recognized her immediately. So then Safwan radiallahu anh then guided her and they arrived in Medina Munawwara. When they arrived in Medina Munawwara, the impure hypocrites in Medina Munawwara took this opportunity to spread an impurity. And what was that? They said, and Aisha radiallahu anha wal ayadu billah wa la hawla wa la quwta illa billah had engaged in an inappropriate relationship with the Sahabi. Now, this blows out to be a very long and gruesome incident known as the accusation. Hadith al-Ifq. And then finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses in the Qur'an purifying and mentioning the purity of Aisha radiallahu anha and how she had engaged in no such act and how she was a pure lady. Another, another um, set of verses that you'll find in the Qur'an regarding her is when Aisha radiallahu anha once again was traveling with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she misplaced her necklace. And that necklace was an expensive one. Aisha radiallahu anha couldn't find it, she couldn't find it. Everyone was looking around, they couldn't find it. The Prophet couldn't find it. The Prophet told the Sahaba, I can't go anywhere until Aisha finds her necklace. So everyone else agreed that they would wait for them too. So while they were looking for the necklace, the day got long, and salah time began to run out. The Prophet ﷺ had his head against Aisha radiallahu anha's lap and he fell asleep there. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anha came next to Aisha radiallahu anha and he started shouting at her. Shouting at her in a low tone. Because of you. Because of you we're late. Because of you everyone is at home. Because of you. And he, as a father, you know, that's what fathers do. And he gave her a piece of his heart. Aisha radiallahu anha says that he got so aggressive because of me, uh, that because I delayed everyone, that my father started poking me in my waistline. And uh, the Prophet wasallam then woke up, and the Sahaba came and said, Our oh, Messenger of Allah, Salah time is running out, and there is no sign of water, what do we do? So that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verses of Tayammum. That's when Tayammum came into place. Before that, there was no ruling of Tayammum. And the Sahaba, they then came to Aisha radiallahu anha, and Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anha, and they said to them, the old family of Abu Bakr, this isn't the first time you've honored this ummah. This isn't the first time you brought ease to this ummah. And Abu Bakr Shadiq was very proud, and so was Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam regarding Aisha radiallahu anha said in one hadith, that Aisha will be my spouse in Jannah. In one narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, the virtue of Aisha over all the other women is like tharid over all the other food. Tharid was viewed amongst the up to premium biryani. Like it was the ribs, the steak. Like that's where you went out to you were going to go to eat. And Farid was like this. Um, uh, it was a meal that had thick consistency with a lot of meat in there. That was the, that was the, the step to it, that it had a lot of meat. 
So just as the Arabs respected Farid so much, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying, this is the rank of Aisha radiallahu anha over all the other women, that she holds a very unique and special place. In one narration, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to the companions that do not say anything to me against Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Do not say anything to me against Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Because revelation would come while her and I would be lying in one sheet. I would be next to Aisha, she'd be lying with me in one sheet, and that's when revelation would come. She was very knowledgeable. Imam Hakim rahmatullahi alayhi says in his mustadrak, إِنَّ رُبْعَ أَحْكَامِ الشَّرِيعَةِ نُقِلَتْ عَنْ سَيِّدَةِ عَائِشَةِ that um, on his Sayyid that the Aisha, he says that indeed one fourth of the rulings of our Islamic law are narrated from Aisha radiallahu anha. Abu Musa al Ashari radiallahu an says there was never a time where the companions were confused regarding an issue, and we didn't know what the answer was, but we would go to Aisha radiallahu anha and ask her, and she would have the answer of what we didn't know that we didn't have knowledge of. Um, Ahmad bin Qais says that I heard the khutbah of Abu Bakr, I heard the khutbah of Omar bin Khattab. I heard the khutbah of Uthman bin Affan and Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. But after hearing all of their khutbah, I have never heard anyone with more eloquent and more beautiful speech than Aisha radiallahu anhu. Because she was a master not in one science, she was a master in all sciences. Urwa bin Subair says, I have never seen anyone who was more knowledgeable in the Quran, more knowledgeable in the matters of inheritance, more knowledgeable in the matters of halal and haram, more knowledgeable in the science of fiqh, more knowledgeable in poetry, more knowledgeable in medicine, more knowledgeable in the speech of the Arabs, their language, and more knowledgeable in the lineage, the, um, the nasab of the Arabs, than Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Imam Zuhri says that if you were to gather the knowledge of all of the people, and then add to that the knowledge of the other wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and compare it to Aisha radiallahu anha's knowledge, I believe that her knowledge may outweigh the other group. There are over 2,000 narrations narrated from Aisha radiallahu anha. She is known from being amongst those companions who narrate abundantly from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was so beloved to the Prophet that one day, Amr bin As radiallahu anha, who accepted Islam later on, uh, later towards the end of the Prophet's life, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he asked, you know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had this characteristic. And his characteristic was that no matter who met him, that person always felt like they were the closest to him. If you met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even just for coffee, you would feel like you were the most important person to him. Because he really cared. He genuinely loved people. He paid attention to them when they were talking. He smiled at them. He had good character with every person he met. So Amr bin As, who in his previous life as a non-Muslim, made many attempts to hurt the Muslims and even kill the Prophet. Now that he accepts Islam, he interacts with the Prophet on a few occasions and he has this beautiful experience. So one day he comes to the Prophet ﷺ publicly and he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I have a question to ask you. Who is the most beloved person to you? He was expecting his name because of those few interactions he had and how much love the Prophet gave him. He just wanted everyone to know who it was. So he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, who is, the most beloved to, who is the most beloved person to you? The Prophet ﷺ said, Aisha. So he said, that's fair, it's his wife. Okay, Minar Rijal, what about from the men? The Prophet said, Abuha, her father. That's it. In another narration, he said, then who? Omar, then who? Uthman, then who? Ali. And Uthman, uh, Amr bin Asr said, he kept saying so many names that at the end of it I thought, you know what, maybe I should stop asking then who, because my name might not even be on this list. And it wasn't that the Prophet wasallam was lying to him, he was just being genuine. That Look, you ask the question publicly, and it's it's important that people know publicly because these are the people who made sacrifice in the earth of Islam. When the Prophet ﷺ came to the last part of his life, I think this just really expresses how much he loved Aisha anha. He, gathered his other, he gathered his other wives together and said to them, I seek your permission to spend the remaining of this illness in the, la- in the house of Aisha anha. And the Prophet spent the last eight days of his life وسلم, in the house of Khadija in the house of Aisha radiallahu anha. Aisha radiallahu anha says, I hold three unique honors that no other prophet holds, no other human being holds. What are those three honors? The prophet passed away in my house, in my lap, while my saliva was in his mouth. 
because she used her saliva to moisten the miswak, which was then used to uh, do miswak for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam before he before he passed away. Now, after Aisha after Abu, after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away, Aisha radiallahu anha engaged in just being alone, kept herself away from people, just dealing with the passing of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She went for Hajj with the Khulafa, in particular with Uthman and Affan radiallahu anh, along with the other wives. They were all sponsored for Hajj by Abdurrahman bin Auf radiallahu anh, so they all went for Hajj together. Um, however, after Uthman bin Affan radiallahu anh, passed away, she became politically involved. Because when Uthman radiallahu anh, was murdered, the people who killed him were not held accountable immediately. And the next Khalifa who succeeded Uthman bin Affan, whose name was Ali bin Abi Talib, made an open statement that he was going to take his time in holding the people accountable who committed this murder. He didn't want to jump to conclusions. He didn't want to make a preemptive move because that could lead to further fitna. So Ali radiallahu anh immediately held off on making a reaction. Aisha radiallahu anha, who at the time was in Mecca Mukarramah, along with Zubair and Talha radiallahu anhuma. They decided to approach Ali radiallahu anh and ask him to make a more quicker response. Ali radiallahu anh refused, which then led to a back and forth, which ultimately led to a battle between the army of Aisha radiallahu anha against the army of Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anh. This is known as the first internal battle in Islamic history. It's also known as the battle of Jamal, yes. The reason why it's called Jamal is because originally Ali radiallahu anh made every attempt to <coughs> repel the battle. He didn't want the battle to happen. And so did Aisha radiallahu anh. She made every attempt to, to avoid the battle. They just wanted to... The reason why they even came to the battlefield, someone can ask if they didn't want to engage in battle, is because this is something the Arabs did. When they wanted to, when they wanted to show how strong they were and how firm they were in their negotiations, they would come with a group of people. Sometimes they would even come with soldiers. And the reason behind coming with soldiers was to show how serious you were and how serious you should be taken. So Ali radiallahu anh came with his people, Aisha radiallahu anh came with her people. And they were saying that we have to come to a conclusion. We have to resolve this issue. And as they were in the process of resolving it, most historical uh, traditions tell us that there were some people who were ill-intended on both sides and they <coughs> instigated the war, which led to a full blow in that war. Now as the fire was happening, these hypocrites who are really trying to get Ali radiallahu anh's side to go full force against Aisha radiallahu anh's side, they realized the only way of doing that was attacking Aisha radiallahu anha directly. And Aisha radiallahu anha came to the battlefield on a camel. So one of the people fired an arrow, and the arrow hit Aisha radiallahu anha, skimmed her, her, her camel. And when that happened, Aisha radiallahu anha's soldiers turned into lions and they got very, very, very upset. That how dare you fire an arrow with intention of striking the wife of the Prophet and you were so close that you injured her animal and these people went monkey. Like they literally went crazy. And that's when the battle went full blown, full fledge. Someone came to Ali radiallahu anha and told him that Aisha radiallahu anha's side, these people are not stopping. Someone fired an arrow and they got very close to hitting her. These people, they're not happy at all. So Ali radiallahu anh said, the only way to stop this bloodshed is for someone to go to Aisha radiallahu anh's side, grab a hold of her camel and pull it out of the, war, the battlefield. Because as soon as people know that she's in safety, they'll back off. Because the reason why they're fighting so aggressively is because they're worried about her. So one person then went inside the battlefield and he pulled her off. In one narration it says that Aisha radiallahu anh fell off her camel. So Ali radiallahu anh went himself and he assisted her, mount her animal again and then pulled her camel out of the battlefield. And when he pulled her animal out of the battlefield, the war more or less came to an end. Aisha radiallahu anh after that stayed apolitical for the rest of her life. She did not engage in politics at all. She outlived Ali radiallahu anh into the Khilafah of Muawiyah radiallahu anh. And it was during the, the Khilafah of Muawiyah radiallahu anh that in the month of Ramadan in the year 58 Hijri, some say 57, some say 59, majority say 58. Aisha radiallahu anha passed away at the age of 67. And she was buried in Baqi. That was her request. That when I'm buried, bury me in Baqi with the other wives of the, with the other wives of Allah. 
from amongst the people who lowered her body into the grave were her two nephews, Urwa bin Zubayr and Abdullah bin Zubayr radiallahu anhuma. Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu was the one who led her janazah. Abu Hurair radiallahu anhu was actually appointed as a governor of Medina Munawwara under the rule of Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan radiallahu anhuma. As I mentioned earlier, Aisha radiallahu anha did not have um, any children. We also know that, I think I mentioned this, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, so I'll just say it again. There are over 2,000 ahadith narrated from Aisha radiallahu anha, which shows a large number of ahadith narrated from her. Now we come to the hadith itself. Okay, that's a brief introduction to who Aisha radiallahu anha is. Uh, one of the greatest scholars of Islam. One of the greatest scholars of Islam. We come to the hadith itself, and where this hadith talks about innovation, this particular hadith talks about innovation. And very soon we'll also read about the categories of innovation. But before I talk about innovation, what I like to do is spend a little time focusing on the opposite of innovation. Because we have a principle, وَبِذِدِّهَا تَتَبَيَّنُ الْأَشْيَاءِ by, that by analyzing and studying the opposites, you can truly understand the reality of something. So if you want to understand what white is, the best way is examine, examine black. Once you know what black is, you'll understand what white is. You want to know what hot is, examine cold. Once you've experienced cold, you'll truly understand what, what, it, what hot is. So what we did the to tabayyan al ashya. Similarly here, before we go into bid'ah, I'd like to spend a few moments examining the opposite of that. Anyone know what the opposite of bid'ah is? Sunnah, yes. The opposite of bid'ah is sunnah. Okay, if you have no idea what the word bid'ah means, just the fact that it's the opposite of sunnah, what does it tell you about this word? It's not good. Okay, anything that's the opposite of sunnah is naturally not going to be a good thing. So similarly, Bid'ah is not a good thing. Let's define sunnah. We may have done this before, but let's do it again. Sunnah is the constant practice of the Prophet ﷺ, or anything established from the Prophet ﷺ, from his actions, his statements, his, uh, his characteristics, his physical and, char- and internal characteristics, his, uh, his biography, also his silent consents. These are all things put together that give you, his, that give you sunnah. Following the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam is something we're told to do. Not only by the Prophet, but also by the Qur'an itself. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَحَاتَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ وَعَمَلًا That Allah is the one who created life and death so that He can test which one of you is the best in deeds. So Imam Razi, under this ayah, while he does tafsir, he says, أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ وَعَمَلًا The one who has best deeds, this means which person is most sincere in their deeds and which person's deeds are closest to the sunnah. These are the two things that make your deeds the best. If your deed is sincere but not in line with the sunnah, it's not good enough. If your deed is in line with the sunnah but not sincere, not good enough. You have to have both things. You have to have the sunnah as a part of your deeds. That needs to be something that we need to bring into our life. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he read the ayah, يَوْمَ تَبْيَضُ وَجُوهُمْ وَتَسْوَدُ وَجُوهُمْ That on the day of judgment, there will be a group of people whose faces will be enlightened with nur, with light, a divine light. And there will be some people whose faces will be darkened. They will not have any divine light. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu says, As for the people whose face will be enlightened, they are the people of Ahl sunnah They are the people who follow the sunnah. And as for the people whose faces will be darkened, فَأَهَلُ الْبِدْعَةِ فَالْبِدْعِ وَالْضَلَالَةِ These are people of innovation and these are people of misguidance. Muhammad ibn Sirin, while talking about the importance of the sunnah, he says, That the people of the past, they used to judge a person's correctness based off of how close that person can follow a trail. So if you're going from one city to another city and someone before you just went there, what's the easiest way for you to go there and a way to ensure that you're going absolutely right? You follow that person's trail. You do exactly what they did. If they did it correctly, you'll be able to do it. The Prophet ﷺ passed through the journey of this life and went on to the hereafter. And the way he lived his life in this world was perfect. So if you're looking for perfection, rather than finding your own route, or going out there and creating your own map, 
the best way for you to do it is to open the books of hadith and follow that. You know, just today earlier on when we were studying hadith uh, in Mishkat, every week I make this reference by the way, the Mishkat class, because the two are hadith and they're connected together. So while we were in Qalam and we were studying the Mishkat, Mishkat al-Masabih, we were talking about the chapter of Adhan. And while we were covering the chapter of Adhan, one of the students said that, Sheikh, I heard that some people, uh, no, sorry, not Adhan, not Adhan, sorry, the chapter of entering and exiting the masjid. So one of the students said, Sheikh, someone told me that there is a reward and sending salawat upon the Prophet when we enter and exit the masjid. Is this something in the hadith that I'm supposed to say, Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad or Allahumma Salli Alaihi Muhammad, every time I enter the masjid, every time I exit the masjid? So I asked him, what do you think? He said to me, Shaykh, it smells like bid'ah. So I said to him, that's very fascinating. You're saying it smells like innovation and bid'ah simply because someone said what? Salawat. As soon as there is a, 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 an increment of reading salawat, what, what do people assume right away? That there's something fishy going on here. Just like when someone says bid'ah too regularly, what does everyone say? Something fishy going on here. You know, why is a person saying bid'ah so regularly? And if someone has um, a very long kurta and a very small shalwar, you know, you know, this person's garment is telling me that he belongs to a particular group. You know, in Urdu we say, bade bai ka kurta, kurta chote bai ki shalwar. Right? If someone whose kurta is very long and their pants are very short, this person belongs to a particular movement and maybe he's after some agenda. So I said to the students that rather than assuming because someone is telling you something, that maybe this person belongs to Ahlul Bid'ah or Ahlul Blah or Ahlul Blah. Rather than saying that, how about we study the hadith? And then it happened to be, today morning in the hadith, there were a few hadith that came on the virtue of sending salawat every time you enter and exit the masjid. And the scholars, they say that when you enter the masjid, you should say, A'udhu Billahi not, not, al this, this is in hadith, so they, they recommend this whole sequence. Every time you enter the masjid, you should say, A'udhu Billahi al-Azim wa bi wajhihi al-Kareem وَسُلْطَانِهِ الْقَدِيمِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ اللَّهُمَّ فِلْ لِي ذَنْبِي وَافْتَحْ لِي أَبْوَابَ رَحْمَتِكَ That's the full dua when you enter the masjid. That includes all the ahadith with all the different duas that are recommended to read when we enter the masjid. Sufyan al-Thawri would say, hold on firmly to the path of the truth, meaning the sunnah. Hold on firmly to the path of the truth because... And he says, hold on firmly to the path of the truth and don't run away from it because there are few people standing on that way. A time may come where there will be a handful of people following the sunnah. But that doesn't mean what they're doing is wrong. You know, it's very possible that they're doing something right and that's why everyone else in shaitan is dragging everyone uh, in, a, in a whole different direction. Abu Uthman al-Hiri says that you make sunnah a part of your actions, a part of your statements and Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala will inspire you with wisdom. And if you turn away from the sunnah in your life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide you towards misguidance. And then he read the ayah, wa in tahtadu. That if you follow the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will be guided. And there are many verses in the Quran about following the sunnah. So we need to embed this in ourselves. That the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not secondary. It's not a maybe or I might. It's I must. The Prophet ﷺ was the perfect specimen. Every action of his was divine, was most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never allow the Prophet to say or do something that wasn't most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you're trying to figure out what's the best way to do something, I am telling you right now, straightforward, there is no other thought in the world of anything being better than the way the Prophet ﷺ did it. That's why when you're making dua to Allah, the best words you can use to make dua are the exact words that were uttered by the blessed tongue of the Prophet ﷺ. If the Prophet ﷺ used a particular sentence structure and a particular set of words when making dua, those words are the best. We try to imitate the Prophet ﷺ more and more. I'll share a little story with you guys. There was one sheikh, there is one sheikh, he's still alive, may Allah prolong his life. Sheikh Yunus Jonpuri. He is known as Muhaddith al-Asr, one of the greatest scholars, living scholars of our time. He is also known as the grand Muhaddith of the subcontinent. He is the most senior scholar of hadith in the subcontinent. And that's kind of like one of those things that's accepted, like one of the most senior scholars of hadith. 
Sheikh um, Dr. Akram Nadwi, for those of you who know him from Oxford, he actually just finished writing a biography on him. And he, he was telling us that he is a gem that the world doesn't know about. And I'm amazed because he is one of the people who influenced me most in my life. Sheikh Yunus Muhaddad al Asr. I had a chance to perform Hajj with him a few times. I was honored Allah gave me the opportunity. One of the times while I was performing Hajj with him, he's a very old man, so he sits on a wheelchair. I was pushing him to the haram. We, came to, we were in Makkah Mukarramah. I pushed him to the haram. We came to the haram. We prayed Maghrib. We prayed Asr Salah. Then we prayed Maghrib Salah. We came from Maghrib. We prayed Maghrib Salah. He then prayed Awabin between Maghrib and Isha. We prayed Isha Salah. When it was time to come, come back to the to the well, what happened was one person came and he shook the sheikh's hand. This person had never met the sheikh before in his life. Maybe he sent some nur. So he came and shook the sheikh's hand. He kissed him on the hand and said, Sheikh, dua, dua, and walked away. He was Malaysian. Then another man came who looked, he seemed to be Nigerian. He came and shook the sheikh's hand. He said, Sheikh, dua, dua, and walked away. A few other people saw it and they all started coming. You know what? This guy, is, uh, he, must, he must be someone important. That's why everyone's shaking his hand. Before we knew it, there was this whole segment of the haram that was surrounded around him. Everyone's trying to shake his hand. And all the cameras in the haram started turning in our direction. And that's when I knew Big Brother was watching and we were going to be in a lot of trouble. So a few moments later, the cops came in. Zahma mamnur, zahma mamnur. Get out of here, they're pushing everyone. Get out of here, no, no congregating in the haram. So one of the cops came to the front and he lifted his hand. He was just about to hit the sheikh. And he said, get out of the masjid. So the sheikh said to me, Hussein, let's go. So I was pushing him out on the wheelchair. While I was pushing him out, he started crying. He was in tears. So I stopped over, I stopped and I pulled over on the side and I said to him, Sheikh, I apologize on behalf of that police officer if he was harsh with you. He said, no, no, he was doing his job. The reason why I'm in tears, and these were his words, he said, Yunus Konta. He's talking about himself. He said, who was Yunus? I was a kid who, who was from a small <coughs> village in India called Jonpur. Nobody even knows where that is. Like small town. Not literally, it's on the map. But you know, nobody's heard of Jonpur. I was from a small village. I used to wear these shorts and I used to have this sleeveless shirt and I used to play in the mud all the time. I was a dirty little kid. I used to make a mess and come home every day. He said, I was destined to never be known in the world. I should have lived and died and no one should have even known of my existence other than the five people who would have you know, known me in my life, in my small little village. But he said, today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored me in a manner that I'm in haram and people are coming from across the road and they want to shake my hand and they want to ask me to make dua. And this woman, he started crying a lot. He said, Hussein, don't be fooled. They don't care about Yunus. Until today, Yunus is an unknown person. His value is nothing. The only reason why these people are coming to me is because I promised to love the sunnah of the Prophet I dedicated my life to the sunnah. As long as I love the sunnah, Allah will honor you. But the moment you leave the sunnah, you will be disgraced wherever you go. And his words, honestly, I think of them quite regularly. You will be honored as long as you have the sunnah. And when you leave the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, that's when you will be disgraced. Now there's this objection that some people have. They say that we can't really follow the sunnah because it's all fabricated and a bunch of mullahs made it all up. You know, People went along with history and they made it up and they made it up and made it up and they fabricated religion. So the mullahs, the scholars of our time have fabricated traditions that support their personal agendas. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna bust the bubble for you. That statement is nothing short of baloney. It's pure, it's like, it's a meaningless statement. It's a statement someone would make who was voting for Donald Trump. You know, someone who believes in loose, empty statements that have no research behind them at all might make a statement like that. But an intellectual person who has any care for research or even a deep eye for reading would never, ever, ever give any value to a statement like that. Because that right there is discrediting 1400 years of thorough research and scholars giving their life to this tradition to ensure every hadith is properly preserved. And this science of preserving the sunnah, this this golden egg, this champion trophy that we have, started right from the times of the Sahaba. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu was known to be the first person. Um, Hafid the Shamsuddin al Dahabi says, who narrates from Ibn Shihab, from Qubaysa bin Du'ayb, that an old lady came to Abu Bakr and she demanded her, her right from the inheritance. 
Abu Bakr Shadiq radiallahu an said that considering your unique situation, there's nothing that the Quran says, nothing that the hadith says about that I'm aware of that that's, tells me how much you're supposed to receive from the inheritance. So then Abu Bakr Shadiq radiallahu an asked the people, is there anyone here who knows any hadith or any information about this? So one sahabi by the name of Mughira bin Shu'bah, he got up and said, yes, I know. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said she will receive one-sixth. So then Abu Bakr Shadiq radiallahu an asked, Mughira bin Shu'aba, provide proof. Who was there? Who was your witness that the Prophet said this? And Mughira bin Shu'aba then went to Muhammad bin Maslama. And Muhammad bin Maslama testified on behalf of Mughira bin Shu'aba. And that's when Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an gave that fatwa. Similarly, during Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an's time, Abu Musa al Ashari came to visit Umar bin Khattab and he knocked on the door three times. When Umar radiallahu an didn't respond, Abu Musa al Ashari left. Now, a little while later, Umar said, Someone was knocking on the door, go check who it was. They went and checked who it was, and they found out that it was Abu Musa, but he left. So Umar radiallahu an became upset that why did you leave? I didn't give you permission to leave. You should have waited for me. You know that I have 10 things going on. That's kind of like the thought going through his mind. So he, he called Abu Musa and said to him, why did you leave? So Abu Musa al-Ashari radiallahu an said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saying that if you seek permission three times and you're not granted permission, you should return back home. So Umar bin Khattab, when he heard this, said, wow, it's an interesting narration. You call someone three times on their phone and they don't answer, you can't continue calling every 30 seconds now. So when he's hearing this, Umar radiallahu an says to Abu Musa al-Ashari, provide proof. Who can support this? If you don't provide proof, I will punish you. He lays it on him. So Abu Musa al-Ashari radiallahu an came to the public sitting area where everyone was sitting and his face color was changed. Someone said, Vaisab Gawa, what happened to you? Why are you so parishan? Why are you so concerned, so worried? So Abu Musa al-Ashari radiallahu an said, this is what Omar said, is there anyone here who could corroborate the hadith? So then a group of Sahaba stood up and said, yes, we also heard this hadith. And Omar radiallahu an was then able to verify it. So the sunnah is something that should be at the core of our life. And once you understand the value of sunnah in our deen, what the sunnah means to us as the Muslims, how sunnah is the only source of guidance for us, that's when you'll understand how evil this opposite of the sunnah is. Before I go to what the opposite or this evil is, I'm going to close off with one thing. How can we bring sunnah into our lives? This is a very important question. I'm going to suggest a few things. First and foremost, learn about the one who you're trying to follow. If you don't know anything about the person who you're trying to imitate, imitating that person will have no value. You and I are trying to imitate the Prophet ﷺ. Go and learn about him. Go and read about his life. Go and read about his sacrifices. Go and read about all the people and the humanity that he's influenced. Go and read about everything. You know, just earlier today, I saw this on, on social media where this sister, she had a post and she said that uh, earlier on this year, Donald Trump started his, um, his smear campaign against the Muslims and that led me to opening the Quran and reading it and I just wanted to let you guys know, let everybody know here that Donald Trump was the one who guided me towards Islam. And that final sentence was a little bothersome but it was tricky but she was sharing her journey to Islam that he was the one who ended up guiding her towards Islam. It was his bigotry that led her to studying Islam. Learn, learn, learn about the Prophet Wasallam. And when you learn, that's when you'll learn to love. Because without, love, without learning, without knowing, you can't love. And after you love, practicing will become very easy. Number three, it'll become very easy to practice. Number four, to secure that practice, stay in the company of people who care about what you do, who care about the sunnah, who care about practicing. Don't be with people who, care, who don't care about the sunnah. Because by sitting with them, they'll never encourage you to become a better person. Sit with people who care about the sunnah. You know? Sit with people who read their du'as when they eat. Who read the du'as after they finish. Who talk in the sunnah. Who smile with the sunnah. Who control their anger. Who are constantly reading and learning the sunnah. And the last thing, remember, the Prophet wasallam said, The one who follows me will be with me in Jannah. If you're looking for a pathway to Jannah, the easiest way is to imitate the Prophet. You know, one narration that really amazes me a lot is that one time a Bedouin came to the gathering, sallallahu alayhi wa When he walked in, he said, Ayyukum Muhammad. You know what that means? That means, 
Which one of you is Muhammad? You know what's interesting about that statement? Like everyone in that gathering had imitated the Prophet ﷺ to the T. Everyone was just modestly, they were all in their dhikr game, like you know, strong on their dhikr game. And here, as soon as, a, as soon as this man comes in the gathering, he sees everyone imitating the Prophet ﷺ. That's why he's compelled to ask the question, Ayyukum Muhammad. Which one of you is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Now we come to the opposite of sunnah. Bid'ah. What does this mean? Now before I get involved um, with this discussion, I want you to know that this next discussion we're going to have is a tad bit technical. Okay? So I'm going to need your undivided attention. And it may not be a bad idea to take notes on what I'm about to say. Because the next part of this class is going to get a little technical. I don't want you to think it's impossible to understand. I will make it easy for you. I'll sum it down for you. But at the same time, I'm going to need your attention so you can um, catch what I'm, I'm going to teach right now. The second thing, as an introduction before I get started, people are terrified of bid'ah. Because the people who usually use this, um, uh, who use this term aren't usually happy. And it's kind of like, in our community, the one who can pronounce the word bid'ah with a better ayin has more authority in religion. If you say bid'ah, as opposed to bid'ah, it's like you are like 10 years ahead of everyone else in your master's program. Okay? Um, that's not true. There are many people in the Muslim world who misuse this word very regularly. People have an idea of what it means, but they don't understand the depth of what it means and what the technicalities are behind this word. So I'm going to walk you not through one definition, but through multiple definitions. And through the evolution of definitions that I will provide to you, we will learn a new depth with each definition, we'll learn a new meaning behind this word, what it means. So we'll start off today with the definition of Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi. Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi alayhi says, Bid'ah is anything done without a prior example in the Sharia. It is an invention of which did not exist in the era of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A bid'ah is anything done without prior example in Sharia. It is an invention of that which did not exist in the era of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what we're learning from this is, by the way, these are technical definitions of what the word bid'ah is. Linguistically, bid'ah means something new, something that didn't exist before. So for example, if there was no, if no one had ever created roller skates before and I was the first person to create them, I would be called a mubtadi'a. The word innovator usually comes in a positive connotation, however in religion we don't like it. In religion it comes in a negative connotation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually calls himself an innovator in the Qur'an. You guys know that? Not in its technical term, but its linguistic term. Badi'u samawati wal ard. The one who created the skies and the earth with innovation. Meaning there was no one before me that did it. I was the first one who created it in a unique and special manner. Now technically here, Imam Nabawi is saying that doing something that did not exist in the Sharia and did not exist in the earlier generation from the Prophet's time. So hold on to that definition. Now based off this, the scholars, they say that bid'ah is of two types. Innovations are of two types. Religious innovations are of two types. The first is called bid'ah i'tiqadi, and the second is called bid'ah amali. Bid'ah i'tiqadi refers to an innovation in beliefs. So, for example, the khawarij. This is known as the first deviant group when it comes to beliefs in Islamic history. And because these were the first people who came with this new interesting set of beliefs that weren't recognized before in the earlier tradition during the Prophet's time. Therefore, that belief system of the Khawarij, we call that bid'ah i'tiqadi. It's, a, it's, a, it's an innovation in relation to belief. Then the second is called bid'ah amali. Bid'ah amali refers to innovation in actions. Now, innovation and actions mean doing something, innovating something in the deen from actions, like doing something or saying something, that the Prophet ﷺ himself didn't say, 
or didn't do. Now there is a big uh, discussion amongst the scholars that can bid'ah be categorized or not. So are all innovations in one big pile or do you categorize innovations in multiple categories? Are you guys understanding the discussion here? So can there be a good type of bid'ah and a bad type of bid'ah? Or are all bid'ahs just one and we should stay away from them, period? So there are one group of scholars who say that there are two types of bid'ah. The first one is called bid'ah hasan. Bid'ah hasan refers to an action which is an, in, it's an innovative action. Let's start again. Bid'ah hasan is an innovative action which does not contradict the Qur'an and Sunnah. An innovative action that does not contradict the Qur'an and Sunnah. Meaning you find precedence of that action in the Qur'an, you find precedence of that action in Sunnah, but maybe the structuring of that action may not be the way it is. So I'll give you an example. We know that the Prophet ﷺ did pray taraweeh prayer. Yes? But during Umar anh's time, the Sahaba used to pray taraweeh prayer in the mosque in small groups. Everyone used to pray in their individual groups. What Umar radiallahu anh did was, he said, let's gather everyone together, not behind multiple imams. Instead of having 10 imams leading 10 taraweeh jama'at inside the masjid, let's gather everyone in one jama'at behind one imam. And then after doing this, he commented by saying, what a beautiful bid'ah. What did Umar radiallahu anh say? What a? What a beautiful bid'ah. So from this, some scholars took the meaning that, you know what? There could be a good type of bid'ah. There could be a good type of innovation. Then the second type of innovation they call on is what we call bid'ah sayyi'ah, an offensive innovation. It's that innovative action which was not practiced during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, and it contradicts the Qur'an and Sunnah. So this is something that didn't exist during the Prophet's time, and it clearly contradicts the Qur'an and also contradicts the Sunnah as well. Now one thing I just want to point out here before we move any forward. You know this categorization of bid'ah, good and bad? Most scholars say the reason why these categories were even created is because the definition of bid'ah wasn't airtight. The definition wasn't airtight. Otherwise these um, categories wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, aren't necessary. And it also seems there was a mix-up between semantics and a technical definition. Because semantically, when we, in terms of semantics, uh, the linguistic definition of bid'ah is anything that's new. Therefore, it seems like a good thing that's new is being called an innovation. When the truth is that once we have a full definition, we'll realize that this good innovation in reality is nothing. It doesn't exist. You know this good innovation category here, bid'ah hasana, in reality it doesn't exist. We just have to give a good definition to bid'ah so it clarifies things. There's another famous scholar by the name of Izzuddin bin Abdul Salam. This is very important, note this down. Izzuddin bin Abdul Salam writes in his Kitab al Qawaid that there are five types of bid'ah, five levels of bid'ah. The first one he calls it wajib. This sort of bid'ah you must engage in. The second is what he calls haram. This sort of bid'ah you must stay away from. The third is what he calls mandub. What does that mean? Preferable. It's not obligatory, but it's a preferable bid'ah. The fourth is what he calls makruh, a disliked bid'ah. Not haram, but disliked. And the fifth is what he calls mubah, meaning it's neutral, not recommended, not discouraged, just in the middle. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. Now after listing these five, he then gives an example for each of the five. For wajib, the first one which was necessary, the necessary bid'ah, he says, the example of this is engaging in the science of jarh wa ta'deel. Jarh wa ta'deel refers to a science the narrators of any particular hadith or the narrators within the science of hadith are criticized. It's a critical study of them. So you'll look into who's a liar, who's not a liar. You'll go into finding out who lived how many, how many years and who didn't live this many years. You know, you do a total breakdown. So because this study didn't exist during the Prophet's time, this detailed critical analysis, what are they calling it? A bid'ah. But they're calling it a wajib bid'ah. Why are they calling it wajib? Because without this bid'ah, without this innovation, 
Hadith won't be preserved. So they're saying this is a must. We must do this. You can see already how there's a lot of semantics involved here. Because someone can easily counter-argue and prove how this is not a bid'ah. But just wait for it. I'll give you a definition up ahead that will clarify things for you. Then bid'ah haram. The absolutely haram bid'ah. What is this? The example he gives is um, um, bid'ah in i'tiqad. This is absolutely haram. That's in a good example. Like for example, what the Jabariya, what the Qadiriya, the Murjiya, the Mujassima, the Khawarij, the Mu'tazila. These were all groups that came earlier on in Islam and they created innovative beliefs that didn't exist during the Prophet's time. So he calls us absolutely haram bid'ah. The mandub, the recommended bid'ah, he says, this is um, like creating Islamic schools or creating a madrasa. Did they have a madrasa or Islamic school during the Prophet's time? They had al sufa but it wasn't really a formalized school with a formalized curriculum and principal and vice principal. Putting a whole school together, this didn't happen during the Prophet's time. Okay? So they're calling this a desirable bid'ah. And the makruh, the dislike bid'ah, he says, is like excessively decorating your mosques. What an interesting example. Just earlier today, one of the students at the seminary was telling me about a masjid that has a chandelier for $50,000. In the USA, by the way. A $50,000 chandelier. And we have people in poverty, and we're spending $50,000 on our chandeliers. What a shame. So he says this is a sort of makruh bid'ah. And the permissible bid'ah, which is mubah, meaning you can do it, you don't have to do it, it's up to you, is like living in luxurious homes, or having increasing delicacies in food and drink. These are all examples of mubah bid'at. During the Prophet's time, people didn't have big homes. They didn't have multiple foods on their table for dinner and for lunch. But it's permissible, but it's a bid'ah and innovation that didn't exist before. Now, this was the statement of Izzuddin bin Abdul Salam. Then comes the muhaqqiq, one of the greatest researchers in Islamic history by the name of Ash-Shatibi. Imam Ash-Shatibi, he then goes to town on Izzuddin. Uh, and this whole group of people who create multiple categories of bid'ah. He says that, look, Imam Shatibi says, if you're calling something obligatory, then it has to be a part of the deen. You guys understand that? If something's obligatory, you just said something's obligatory, you said that there's a Bid'ah that's obligatory. So what is Imam Shatib saying? If it's obligatory, then it has to be a part of the deen. There has to be some framework or some principle according to which we can bring it and make it a part of the deen. And the second thing he says is that if something is disliked, then what does that mean? That it has to be outside the deen. So this whole thing of creating a bid'ah that's inside and outside, he says that doesn't make any sense. Now here's a definition of bid'ah that I'd like for you guys to note down. And this definition of bid'ah, inshallah, will be the definition I want you to use and it'll put everything into perspective. Bid'ah means to introduce something in the religion. Bid'ah means to introduce something into the religion that was not done during the time of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the rightly guided khulafa. See how we added that there? You see how we added that? By adding that, we just dealt with so much of the above problem of bid'ah hasana and sayyi'ah and five different types of bid'ah. And some scholars even add after that the rightly guided scholar, the, the righteous salaf, the, 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 righteous, the, the righteous predecessors, salaf al salihin. So they say, Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the khulafa, and they also say the early generations. Then they say, with the intention of gaining reward. With the intention of gaining reward. Now this is the most important part. Listen to this carefully. Despite being need for it in the time of the Messenger wasallam, it was not implemented. Despite being a need for it, during the time of the Prophet wasallam, it was not implemented. What does that mean? So let's go through this again. Anything that didn't happen during the Prophet's time, we don't find a precedent for it there. During the time of the Khulafa al-Rashidin, during the time of the earlier generations, and it's done with the intention of good deeds. What, is, what does that mean? So for example, can someone say driving a car is bid'ah? Yes or no? 
Technically speaking, linguistically, yeah, but technically, no. The reason is because nobody drives a car thinking that they're going to get rewarded for it. The first part of the definition applies to riding a car. Because the Prophet didn't ride a car, said Allah Wasallam. neither did the Sahaba, neither did the earlier generations. But the reason why driving a car and eating biryani and dressing the way you're dressed right now is not considered a bid'ah is because we don't do, we don't drive a car or ride in a plane, or fly in a plane because we think it's a part of the religion. If someone thought that driving an S-Class Mercedes was sunnah, they would slap in the back of their head. Because that would be a class, right? That would be an amazing example of bid'ah. We do have examples like that, unfortunately. Um, but nonetheless. And the last part was, despite there being a need for it, that action wasn't implemented. So the scenario did exist. But that product wasn't bought into place to deal with that scenario. So what does that mean? So faulty um, aqaid, faulty beliefs didn't exist during the Prophet's life, for example. So because they didn't exist, later on when they do exist, the methods that are created to deal with those faulty beliefs will not be called bid'ah. The reason is because the model that you use to deal with the challenge you're facing right now, that challenge didn't exist during the Prophet's time. Are you guys following that? That challenge, that technology, that reality didn't exist during the Prophet's time. So that's why, despite being a need for it in the, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, it was not implemented. Um, from this we also learn that anything that's done during the times of the companions, anything the companions bring into existence, is not considered an innovation. For example, um, establishing an additional adhan for Jum'ah. During the Prophet's time, how many adhans were there for Jum'ah? One. Today we have how many adhans for Jum'ah? Two. That second adhan was added by the Sahaba. Therefore, we don't consider that a bid'ah. Um, similarly, praying 20 rakat taraweeh prayer. That was established by Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. That's why it's not considered to be a part of a bid'ah. Praying it in, in, in congregation. That's why it's not considered to be uh, uh, an element of bid'ah. Someone can then argue and say, but why should I follow the Sahaba? My allegiance is only to Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Well, that's because the Prophet told you to. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith, follow my example and the example of the Khulafa al-Rashideen. Abdu alayha bin nawajid. Bite onto it with your molars. In one narration, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, as narrated by Imam Tirmidhi, Imam Ibn Majah, and Imam Ahmad, and other scholars as well, that follow the footsteps of the two people who will follow me, Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu. In closing, Imam Malik rahimahullah ta'ala says, and this teaches us the importance of staying away from innovation. Okay? Innovations have become very common in our deen. Unfortunately, many people spend more time in innovations. When you go to Muslim countries, that's what you see. People don't find the command of Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be appealing, so then they turn to innovative actions. Right? They're not pleased to know that no one ever worshipped a grave. I went to India once, when I went there, someone told me that there is a grave that you should go visit. I, I didn't realize what was happening. I thought to myself, okay, going to a graveyard is always a good thing. The Quran tells us, حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ maqabir." So, let's go. When I came to the grave, when I came to this grave, it was like a structure. That's when I realized this was a dargah, this wasn't a grave. But, uh, this was a new experience for me. So I followed Allah. When I got there, there's a person, one lady sitting outside with very long hair. Very, I don't know if it was, actually, I don't know if it was a lady or a guy. There was a, some person there with very long hair. And everyone there, the tradition is that if you want to go inside, you have to leave your shoes with this person. So I said to that person who took me there, that Baisa, I'm going to hold on to my slippers. He said to me, Sheikh, it's disrespectful to take your slippers into the shrine. I said, who said it's disrespectful? He said, well, that's the culture here. You have to leave it behind. I felt very, sh- very shady about it. So I went to the cab driver who drove us there. I said, you know what? I'm going to give you a few hundred rupees extra. You just hold on to my slippers and please don't go missing. Right? I didn't know if that lady was going to do some magic on there or something. I didn't want her touching my slippers. So I went inside. When I went there, they had a full-blown rave party going on in there. People were shaking their heads. They were waving side to side. When I got to the grave itself, I asked the brother, now everyone's staring at us, and the reason why they're staring at us is because we're wearing thobes. And um, usually people who wear thobes, who go to shrines, are uh, not really happy people. And I, I, was still, uh, underst- I was still in the process of understanding what was going on, by the way. 
So I, I reach inside and I'm sitting down and everyone's staring at me and my buddy. And um, I just, uh, you know, was reflecting and reading the du'as when you visit a graveyard and just sitting there. And while I was sitting there just reflecting over death, I saw this guy, this is the funny part of the story, I saw this guy who got up in front of me and he literally did tawaf of the Kaaba. I'm not Kaaba, sorry. He literally did tawaf of the... He did tawaf of the grave. After he was done, I came to him and I said, Brother, why did you do tawaf of the grave? Tawaf is an ibadah that's khas bil makan. There's only one place in the world you can do tawaf. And that is of the Kaaba. You can't even do tawaf of the Prophet's grave. Why are you doing it here? And that guy looked at me and said, Leave me alone, Wahhabi. <laughs> and I said, Okay. If that's, if that's what it is, what you want to do, I'm going to leave you alone and walk away. Then I went inside the cab and I told the cab driver of my experience. And he said to me, that's nothing big, I come here two, two times a week. And that's when I realized that this practice was more common than I thought it would be. I was actually telling the students earlier on in class that Alhamdulillah in America, we don't have this. I haven't seen this in America where people go to, uh, go to visit graves. I mean, we go to visit graves, that's a sunnah. I'm not asking anyone not to visit a grave, by the way. Visiting a grave is from the sunnah of the Prophet I'm talking about all the hocus pocus that goes around, that goes along there. And then we have all sorts of ajib parties. One day one person came to me. I remember while I was in Chicago. And he said, Sheikh, is it true that there is a sunnah to have halim on the night of Shabbat Barah? <laughs> and on the 15th of Shaban we should have halim. I said to him, my dear friend, Aisha radiallahu anha said that two months at a time they would only have water and dates. What are you talking about halim? Like I doubt the Prophet ever had halim his entire life. What are, you, like, what, what are you talking about? Someone one day came and... Anyway, khair. There are so many examples, so many examples, so many examples of bid'ah in our communities. Unfortunately, but it's a reality. I mean, there are some that we all experienced while growing up. The most famous one that all of you probably have experienced. And I feel like saying this example again is like me just wasting time. But fold your musallah before you stand up after salah. Right? I mean, there are so many of them that people grew up practicing and doing just because everyone did it because everyone did it. That was it. You know, the 8th of Rajab was um, Laylatul Mi'raj. Just today we were studying the hadith of Laylatul Mi'raj with the students. And I told them there are over 12 opinions of when Mi'raj happened. The scholars of hadith cannot agree which year it was. Forget about the date and the month. I don't know how these people figured out 14th and 17th of Rajab and 8th of Rajab and they figured out an exact date when the muhaddithin are nowhere near that. They're like all over the place. You know, they're, they're, try, they're trying to figure out what it is. So people, they have these uh, faulty innovations and they come up with these arguments. You know, um, Imam Malik says, and I'm going to close with this. Whoever innovates an innovation, believing it to be a good, be, believing it that it's something good, has indeed claimed that the Prophet ﷺ betrayed the trust and he didn't complete, deliver the complete religion to us. Because you're trying to say that there's some act of worship that you found right now that the Prophet ﷺ forgot to tell us about. And that innovator clearly is violating the verse of the Quran, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمْ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا You don't need someone to come and tell you to hop on your right foot ten times while, while waving your left here while you say some tongue twister malakut jabarut. You know, you can go pray two rakah, raise your hands and make dua to Allah. And the results will be much more pure. The results will have, they will bring fruits much more effectively. You know, stick to the tradition. Stick to the foundations. If I may say, stick to the basics. So the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. There's no rocket science here. It's just simple stuff. You know, we were reading the hadith earlier. The Prophet ﷺ says, Whoever um, walks to the masjid, waits for salah, and does wudu properly. Whoever walks to the masjid, waits for salah, and does wudu properly, the Prophet says that person will live a beautiful life and will die a beautiful death. Simple solutions, they're everywhere. They're all through the hadith. The Prophet left so many solutions for us in our lives to fix things. So, to summarize this hadith, what we're being taught here is to avoid innovations. Follow the Qur'an. Follow the sunnah. Do what the sahaba did. If you find someone telling you something that's against, that violates the sharia, walk away. There are examples of this in our community. Where there are people in the community that are telling women that engage in this action with me, which the sister knows clearly violates the sharia. 
If some imam or some sheikh or some peer in the world is telling you to do something that clearly violates the sharia, should you continue or discontinue? Your allegiance is not to an imam or to a sheikh. Your allegiance is to Allah and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Withdraw. Disengage right away. If you see someone is doing something that's a bid'ah, leave it. Don't engage anyone. If someone is telling me that, this, I, I did the sisters class in the masjid, one of the sisters was telling me that there, apparently there's someone who comes to the Dallas DFW area and she was telling me <laughs> that, uh, that there's someone who comes and does some dua or does some kind of hocus pocus business and uh, people go to that person for getting barakah and one person went to that person and said, that, you know what, I have some sort of a lottery or some sort of a machine, you know, they have these gambling machines, I need barakah in the business. And that lady or that person started making dua for that person too. Allah gave barakah and said, you know, take this ta'weez and put it here and do that. So, you know, that's like, that's like silly. You know what I mean? Like first of all, what you're doing is silly. And second of all, you're making dua for someone or something that is not permissible in the deen. You should tell that person, brother, you're violating the sharia and what you're doing. Stop doing that. You're giving your stupidity away. Ali radiallahu anh said, if you don't want people to know you're stupid, stay quiet. Don't say anything. They won't know how intellectual you are or how foolish you are. But the moment you open your mouth, you give it away. That's when they can tell what your true value is. So, in summary, stick to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That's where our allegiance is. That's where our bond should be. There is nothing in the world that can be offered that is more impactful in your spiritual growth, if your deen or for your dunya, that is better than anything the Prophet ﷺ offered. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps us from the pious and righteous and saves us from the innovators in a life of innovation. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.